Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next Unreal webinar. My name is Daryl Obear, and today we have Cameron joining us from Microsoft. We're going to be looking at what it's like to work with Unreal Engine and the HoloLens 2 to create a mixed reality experience. This is a pretty high level overview, so at the end of the presentation, you should have a pretty good understanding of what it's like to actually do mixed reality development work inside of Unreal Engine for the HoloLens 2 device. Hope you guys enjoy it. Cheers, everybody. So the first thing that you're going to want to do is go to the Microsoft GitHub page and find the Mixed Reality Toolkit for Unreal. On this page, you're going to get everything you need to create a Unreal Engine based Mixed Reality experience on the HoloLens 2. And the main things that you want to grab are the UX tools for Unreal and the graphics tools for Unreal. These are going to work in conjunction with the plugins that ship with Unreal. So the HoloLens 2 engine plugin and the Mixed Reality engine plugin. So with that stuff downloaded, let's jump over into the editor and check out our project. So this is what the finished project actually ended up looking like. And this is using all that example content that we previously downloaded. We just imported in the PC components into that project. And it's comprised again of those UX tools, uh, examples and content. And those are gonna be primarily for building the buttons and sliders and getting all the hand interactions and things like that hooked up. And then of course, we're using the graphics tools example content. And this is stuff that's slightly more complex. It's going to give you improved visual fidelity for your mixed reality applications while staying within the performance budgets of the HoloLens 2. And there's some really fun things in here like proximity lights, as well as some really beautiful materials that are very, very fast. And this MT, MGT default lit is actually the main material that we're using to get the overall look and feel of that PC. And you can see that it's using a unlit shading model, so it's gonna be very, very fast. And the main workhorse of this is this material function, this GT default lit. And really what this is, is an HLSL shader that the guys at Microsoft put together. Um, and it just does a beautiful job. So that's gonna be the main, the main uh, material that we're going to be working with as we build up the overall look and feel of this. So obviously we imported in geometry into the sample project and that means everything was kind of set up. But if you had your own project and you wanted to go ahead and start to you know, do mixed reality with it, there are a few things that you'd want to set up in that project. So the first thing you need to do is go into the plugins and in the plugins, if you just search for mixed, there's going to be a variety of these plugins that you're going to want to turn on. And obviously since we've based our project by importing geometry into an already existing project. These were already all turned on, but just go through, make sure those guys are all turned on if you're trying to do this with your own project. And then there's some project settings that you're gonna to wanna to turn on and off that are, that are pretty essential, pretty important. So let's go ahead and just jump over into project settings and I'll show you a few of those. So first one that you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have turned on is the forward renderer. So the HoloLens 2 is always gonna use the forward renderer. By turning this uh, flag on, it's gonna basically make the desktop version of the editor also use the forward renderer. So you, you kinda wanna do that so that you have a match and look. Of, it's very important actually. And then of course, the vertex fogging for opaque is turned on. So those are a couple things. And then if you go and search for mobile, inside of mobile, there's gonna be a few things that jump out at you. So the mobile MSAA needs to be turned off. This is something, um, that HoloLens 2 just doesn't really want to have on, so make sure that's turned off. You're going to want to turn off the culling also, and you're basically going to then jump over into the VR section. There's a couple of important ones in VR. So let's just kind of grab that and scroll up here. So the instance stereo is, is turned on, and the mobile multi-view is also turned on. The mobile HDR is turned off, and this is pretty significant. We're gonna see the effect of that being turned off in just a second here. So just this is this is one of the things that really changes the difference between the the desktop renderer and the mobile the mobile renderer. So let's just go ahead and, and check that out now. So what we have here obviously is the finished computer. It's using all that um, you know, that unlit shading model on all the materials here. And if we wanted to see what this would look like more on the mobile or on the HoloLens 2, we can actually simulate that by jumping into play and just playing this in Pi for the mobile preview. So as soon as we do that, it's gonna kind of go out and launch this off. And we'll just kind of dock this window kind of over here. And then we'll, we'll make this one over here and 
just hit F11 to kind of zoom that up. So you can see that there's, there's a pretty significant difference between the look on the mobile uh, preview versus what would be on the desktop editor preview. And really what's happening with this is, you know, a lot of the information is being derived from this cube map that's sort of wrapping around the whole scene that's giving us the ambient lighting and also giving us that, that kind of reflection lighting on the, on the glass panel there. And obviously because mobile HDR is turned off, it's going to not have quite as much contrast. It's going to be a little more flat and washed out. So really what we're doing when we're starting to do look development is we want to try to get the editor to, to match up with what's going on inside of the mobile device or the HoloLens 2 so that we can make informed decisions, right? So how do we, how do we go around this problem? Well, it's actually pretty easy and pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and just exit out of that guy and we can just zoom this back to full screen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually go over to our settings and we're going to switch our render level from Shader Model 5 over to Android. Now, yes, we're gonna be running this on a HoloLens 2 and it runs on a Snapdragon processor, but it's actually kind of this unique little device that's running Windows 10. And even though it's a mobile platform, it's actually using Shader Model 5. So don't let this name confuse you. When you, when you switch this over to the Android, uh, e ES31, it actually is going to be pretty similar to what you're going to be seeing on the HoloLens 2 and on the mobile device. So by making that switch, you can see we now have a button up here and that button allows us to toggle back and forth between um, seeing the preview of the mobile device and not seeing the preview of the mobile device directly inside of, inside of the editor, which is really pretty awesome. Now, because it got a little washed out, I'm gonna to wanna to adjust some color settings now that I've got this in this kind of better previewing mode. And when you're working on the HoloLens 2, because it's an additive device, you're gonna to wanna to make things probably a little bit brighter than you normally would inside of the editor. And things like black, they're gonna be transparent, so you're gonna push those black levels up into the gray. So we're gonna we're gonna make this a bit a bit poppier and a bit more contrasty. And like I said before, a lot of the the look and the feel of this is coming from uh, a, a reflection map that's kind of wrapped around into a cube map on all of those materials. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're just going to kind of pop that a, a little bit brighter. So if we jump into our textures setting here and I grab this cube map, this is basically, uh, this is actually the, the cube map that ships with the, it's in the engine content. And what we've got here is I've actually got that kind of cranked up a little bit, a little bit brighter. So I'm just going to increase that a bit more Brightness curve is, uh, it's basically a power, right? So if we put this to something like 1.7, oops, not 17, that's gonna be crazy. We don't want that. We wanna do like 1.7. Um, you're gonna see that it's gonna get, a, it's gonna get a, little bit, a little bit more poppy, a little bit more contrast inside of there, and that starts to look a little bit better. Now, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the light. So there's a directional light that is tied into, um, into that GT default lit material. This is a special light made to work specifically with that unlit workflow. Um, and it's going to get a little bit brighter just to kind of, again, overdrive the overall effect of that. So once we do something like that, it actually starts to look pretty good. And that's, you know, a lot popular, very similar to what we had when we weren't doing the mobile preview. And you can see how nice and bright that is. And I know that on the additive display, that's going to pop out and look, look, uh, you know, really pretty good. So the final thing that we're going to want to do is we're just going to escape this out. We're just going to go ahead and we're going to preview this instead of using the mobile previewer just in the selected viewport. So when I do that, you can see that we get these nice little preview hands. I can move those around and I can, um, I can actually start to go in here and start to, you know, trigger some of the effects that, that Cameron had set up on this guy. So it's really um, very, very fast and easy to start iterating with these kind of virtualized hands of the HoloLens 2 device directly inside of here, which is, which is pretty cool. Now, another thing that we can do really quickly is if we just type in stat RHI in this guy while this is playing back, you can see our performance. And, you know, basically what's going on here is right now my triangles and my draw calls are a little bit high. So if I go ahead and I hit F11, it's actually going to give me a better read of what's actually going on inside of here. So the UI inside of Unreal is actually drawn using, um, 
you know, those draw calls and all the average stuff. So by turning it into F11 mode, you're basically going to get a true read of what's going on here. And having it around 100, and, you know, 100 draw calls and around 100,000 polys, you know, is kind of the ideal range. And that's exactly where we're at with this data set here. It's a little heavy on the geometry, but it actually wasn't slowing it down on the device. We were, we were totally fine. So that's the basics of getting your project set up and ready to work with the HoloLens tools. So we're going to talk about look development uh, a bit more in depth now. Okay, so here we are at the very beginning of the look development process. And basically what I have is the PC after it's been imported in from the DCC. Most of the materials that are on the PC are currently using the standard Unreal materials that are set to default lit. There are a couple that have the graphics tools materials already assigned to it. I've also got two Macbeth charts in here that came from the automotive material pack that you can get from the content browser. The top Macbeth chart is using standard Unreal materials that are set to default lit. The bottom one is using the graphics tools materials in an unlit mode. And I've got a simple lighting model in here. So it's got the skylight with the cube map piped into it. So that's gonna give us sort of our ambient light. And then I just have a little bit of a directional light in here to give a little bit of warmth and a little bit of pop. So a very simple basic lighting model that's gonna look good on the HoloLens too. Now, obviously, if I start to increase the intensity of this directional light, it's going to affect the materials that are set to default lit and not affect the materials that are the unlit materials or the graphics tool uh, materials that came from Microsoft. So what we want to do is ultimately we want to get this PC all dressed with the graphics tools materials. But I just wanted to show you kind of the basic lighting workflow and share with you a few tips and tricks along the way to, to kind of help you guys out. So with that done, the, the, the first thing that we want to do is obviously this Macbeth chart on the bottom does not have a directional light hitting it. So let's go ahead and get that directional light that works with the graphics tools added in. And this is easily done by going to the place actors and just searching for GT tools. You can see that there's proximity lights and directional light. So we'll just drag and drop this in there. And it's a little bright. So we'll just put that down to a value of one. And I want to get the, uh, I want to get these guys to kind of copy the, the rotational value off of this light. So we'll copy that and then we'll just paste it onto, onto this guy so that they're kind of in the same angle. So these Macbeth charts now are starting to look a little more similar. And really the idea is to use this Macbeth chart to go ahead and really dial in that lighting, get your base lighting set. And this is pretty easily done using the pixel inspector. So if you go to the developer tools and bring up the pixel inspector and we start to play this, it's going to give me just coordinates and not really kick back any color information. And the reason that it's doing that is because we're in the mobile preview mode. So as soon as we jump back to the desktop mode by, by muting that guy, you can see that it, you know, it's, it's now recording values, but the color changed a pretty significant amount between the desktop version and the mobile version. Here's a pretty cool trick. If you switch this to unlit, look at the graphics tools down here on the bottom and look at the change between these guys now. They're really pretty similar to each other. So by switching to unlit mode, when you're in the, in the desktop mode, it's going to allow me to use the pixel inspector to fine tune and dial in that gray value. And really what we want to do is we want to get these, these values right here around that mid, that mid value of you know, 0 0.18. So how do you do that? Well, pretty straightforward. We're just going to take that GT directional light and start to increase its intensity. We'll go up to something like 1.3. And now you can see that that mid value is, is kind of reading in the, in the 0.18, except the blue. So it's a little, it's a little hot on the blue. So you can, can you also use this to really kind of fine tune where that white point is. So I'm just going to go back to that directional light and warm it up a little bit by pulling out a little bit of blue. And now if we go back and take another reading on this guy, you know, we're really getting close to having that that mid value kind of nailed, which is exactly what we want. So now we can jump back into the desktop mode and switch this back over to, to lit. So the next thing that I want to kind of talk to you guys about briefly is, is the way that these graphics tools materials are, or kind of using cube maps to simulate obviously the reflection as well as that, that ambient light. And what's going on is every single one of these materials, like if we double click on this guy and bring up this material, you can see that, you know, on that material, it's got the cube reflection kind of added into it of, of that same epic 
courtyard. And that's going to happen on every single one of, of these, you know, these albedo balls. And the, it's, it's, you know, there's about six or seven materials on there. So to have to go through and change every one of those maps, if I wanted to switch the lighting model around, can be a little tedious, right? So what I've done is I've come up with a nested workflow where I'm going to take a material instance of that um, base material and then nest that instance inside of all these other instances. So by doing that, it allows me to change just one um, one cube map. So I've got this parent of, of all of these objects that are in that albedo chart. Let's just kind of move this over so you can see the change here happen. If we double click on the albedo cube map, you can see that it is actually now, um, a, a, again, another instance. And if we double click on this guy, it's going to show us, you know, the actual material graph. So it's set to unlit. It's using the GT defaults and piped into that. I've got, you know, a few things here. We've got the albedo going through a power. I've got the vertex colors also going through a power. So it's interesting. It doesn't actually use texture map information. It's using um, vertex color for that stuff. And I have a little switch that lets me, you know, add some, some functionality into there. But for all practical purposes, you know, this cube map that, that's part of this guy is what's being um, referenced in this initial instance. So by changing that one cube map on the albedo cube map, like if I just go and change this guy, like, um, I don't know, we'll just search for cube. And I'll grab this uh, this HDR here. You can see that you know in one click I was able to update seven seven or so materials. So really really fast easy way. And then if we just type uh, cube again, we can get back to back to this back to this guy right here. So with that done, um, let's go ahead and close that down. Let's just exit out of that guy and. Let's just sort of zoom back out here. And you can see that once that, that mid, mid value is kind of set, everything just sort of sorts to, to come together. It starts to look really, really pretty nice and pretty good. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to start to build up some more materials on this PC using uh, the graphics tools. And I'll just show you how to, how to do that. Again, pretty straightforward stuff. So let's go ahead and grab this, double click on that instance. We're going to go up to the master for that guy. And obviously this is set to use the default shading model, default lit. So let's just expand this out a little bit and push that PC over so you can kind of see the effect here when we do this guy. So I'm going to switch this to unlit. Uh, that's going to be great. It's going to be very, very fast. And then if I right click and just search for GT, you can see that I can grab the GT default lit. And that of course goes into the emissive color. And then we can just start to map these guys sort of back in here. So metallic and then roughness, and that starts to look pretty good. So if I hit apply on this, it's going to go through and it's going to update all the materials that that master kind of, you know, fed into. So if we kind of zoom out here and see a little peek of that PC, you can see that it's, you know, it's kind of bright now. So this is, this is looking pretty good. Now, really what I did to get the, the kind of overall lighting for this, I was playing around a lot with ambient occlusion. And what I ended up doing was taking all these uh, components of the PC out of Maya into Substance Painter and baking lighting maps in Substance Painter that were very broad to give me this kind of nice diffuse lighting model. So let's check that out right now. Okay, so here we are in Painter, and inside of Maya, I went through and laid out all the UVs on this object onto channel zero, and then on channel one, I've also got another set of UVs that are used for the color information, normal map information, and a secondary detail map for some of the objects that has ambient occlusion baked into that. So what we want to do is we want to basically bake a really nice broad AO pass on all this geometry. And this is super fast and easy to do in Substance Painter. So all you have to do is go ahead and jump over to the bake mesh settings. And I'm going to turn off all these other options for these maps. We don't really care about those. We just want the ambient occlusion map. And I'm going to bake that out for all the geometry in my scene. So you can see it's going to go through and in a, in a matter of seconds, generate this really nice AO pass for me. And if we just switch this over to view, uh, view here, you can kind of get a sense of, you know, what's going on with that. So that's really what's going to give me that very nice diffuse lighting model, which looks really, really good in the device, in the HoloLens too, having this sort of global illuminated AO feel to the holograms really makes them feel, you know, pretty, pretty awesome actually. So let's go ahead and jump back over into, uh, into Unreal and check out what those maps look like once they get applied. So Let's go ahead and just uh, jump over to my textures and in my AO Painter, you can see there's all the texture maps. And what we're gonna do is we're going to go ahead and just 
go back into that PC white master material. And in that guy, I'm going to just drag in this AO map into, into um, the ambient occlusion. And it's worth noting that, like I said, it's using the channel zero for, for that map. So we're gonna go ahead and just drag and drop this guy into the ambient occlusion spot. And if we hit apply on this, it's going to go through and it's going to add in that. And you can, you know, you get that sense of that, you know, AO being added into all these little parts inside of here. You can really see it, you know, sort of up in this area and things like that. So it goes through and it does a really, really nice job of just giving that kind of nice global illumination kind of feel to that, to that PC and to all the, all the geometry associated with that. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next thing. So the next thing that we want to talk about are a couple of things that you can do to, uh, again, help performance on the HoloLens 2. So we're going to go ahead and look at this motherboard texture map, and we're going to improve the look of this. It's really, really flat right now. And I'm going to do that by bringing up the master for it. And let's just go back into here and double click on that motherboard and load up this mTexture master. So what we're gonna do is we're going to switch this over to be uh, again using that GT tools. Uh, so if we hit tab and search for GT default lit and change this model over to be unlit, pretty straightforward there. We'll throw that into the emissive color. What we're gonna do is we're going to pipe in a few of these maps here. So we've got our color map, pretty straightforward. That's gonna go into base color. And then I've got this funky looking map over here. And what this is, is this is just a, a map that's been combined together. So in one map, I'm carrying the color information for three maps. So I'm, I, by doing this, it's going to make things just be a bit more performant. Like you don't wanna to have too many texture maps going out to the HoloLens too. So by, by you know, joining three of these guys together, you can really get a, a pretty nice performance improvement. So on my red channel, I've got my detailed AO. On the green channel, I've got the roughness. And then on the blue channel, it's going to be the, the metallic. So by combining all of those guys together, you know, it just saves a little bit of information, uh, which is going to make things run a bit more performant on the device. So let's go ahead and just uh, add in the roughness for this guy as well as the metallic for it, which is pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. And then for the ambient occlusion, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually use um, these two different maps. So if you remember, I talked about the fact that on channel one, you can see right here my constant coordinate on channel one is set to, um, for the color information, the normal map information, all those guys are using channel one. And then that broader AO map is using uh, UV channel the channel zero. So what we want to do is we want to multiply those two guys together. And that's easily done by just holding down the M key to bring up the multiply node and clicking with the left mouse button. And we'll just grab the red out of that. And then we can grab the red out of this guy and just shove that into the ambient occlusion. And it's going to give me, you know, this kind of a uh, hit apply on that guy. And you can see as it, as it pops in there, you know, the map just starts to look a lot better and you can really get a sense of, you know, that kind of reflection sort of crawling across there. And, and it just starts to look, a lot better than it did. And obviously you can see that the combination of those two, uh, those two ambient occlusion maps sort of multiplied together to give me that, that end result, which is exactly what we want. So the next thing that we want to talk about um, is tiling and how to get some performance um, if you've got meshes that have repeating textures on them. So this is actually really pretty awesome. This is a great, a great tip. So I've got this mesh here. Let's go ahead and grab that guy. It's kind of hard to select. I think I got it, perfect bring up the master for this guy. So you can see I've got my UV tile set to be 150 on that guy. So let's jump into this. And this is, um, this is already set up here using the, uh, the, the GT tools, which is great. And you can see that I've got two different texture samples happening. So I've got my AO pass on zero, like we talked about before. And then if we look at this guy, the repeating mesh grid is happening on coordinate one. And the way this is mapped right now, going into that texture sample, it's actually a pixel shader, right? And this is, this is kind of costly. So we can actually do this UV tiling and repeating with a vertex shader. So how do you do that? It's actually really, really really pretty simple to do and, and very, very cool. So if we go back to this material and we just search for custom, you can see that you can add customized UV. So if I put this to two, I'm gonna get the two texture channels that I need. And all I have to do is just unmap that guy and 
you know, this is still going to be even using the, the first UV ch channel. I'm just going to pipe this into the second UV channel. And just like that, now if we hit apply, that's going to, you know, tile at and be much less costly because it's doing it at the vertex level instead of at the, the you know, the pixel, the pixel level. So really, really fast, very, very easy workflow. So those are a couple little tips and tricks to get more performance out of your, uh, out of your rendering when you're working with Unreal and HoloLens 2. So final thing that we got to talk about super quickly, we're, we're running out of time, is just uh, what the variant manager does and how, how that is going to get handed off into Cam, Cameron so he can, um, he can start building up some more complex UI elements. Let's, uh, let's jump over and check that out right now. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of this look development level and get back into the, uh, the more finished level that we kind of saw at the beginning here, so you can get a sense of what you know what this really does look like inside of uh, inside of the editor. Again, we're using the uh, the mobile preview, um, and it you know it really does kind of look. I think it looks pretty good. Uh, and in the device, it it's super super cool looking. One thing to keep in mind when you're working with the additive display, I think I might have mentioned this before, but if I didn't, you're going to want to make things that maybe a little bit brighter than you normally would. Blacks are going to read as transparent, so those are going to need to be lifted a little bit. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're doing your look development work in the, in the actual editor. So what we're going to do is just give you a quick overview of what the uh, variant manager does. And it's already been set up in this scene. Um, and since we're so quick on time and Cameron's going to be using this to build up, I'll let him kind of, you know, show some of the wiring up of it. But essentially what the variant manager is, is a very fast tool that allows you to create options for, for objects in your scene. So you basically go through and create variants. So I have one set up for color and I have one set up for the cooler and you populate these different variants with actors and you specify which parameters you want to have the variant manager watch. So what I've got here is I've got obviously the dark mode and then I've got the light mode. And then of course we've got the two different variations for the, for the cooler. So it, it can watch a variety of things. It's actually quite flexible. Um, you can extend the functionality of it and do many, many cool things with it. So obviously we've got the air cooler already on. And if I click on the liquid, you know, we could obviously go liquid with the dark. So these are the options that that are the kind of set up inside of here. And again, it's just a matter of kind of dragging in the actors, specifying, you know, what parameters you want. You could say add a property, go through and pick any of these properties, and then those will be also watched by the variant manager. So super easy, fast, straightforward tool to work with um, to build up these very complex relationships. So with that done, I'm going to um, basically hand it off to Cameron. He's going to take over and build some really, really interesting functionality and, and kind of use the variant manager and, and help him in building out that, that UI experience. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, over to you, Cam. Cheers. Hello, everybody. This is Cameron speaking. Now that Daryl's provided us with an excellent base to work off of, we can start building out UI for HoloLens 2. And to do that, we're going to use UX tools and graphics tools. So if we look at the content within our project, we have a UX tools content folder, a graphics tools content folder, but then we also have UX tools examples content and graphics tools examples content. Now, most projects won't pull in these examples unless you want to reference them, which is exactly why we pulled them in. And we're going to look at the UX tools examples content folder. And within this folder, there's tons of different levels. Each one of these levels contains examples of a specific feature. I'm going to jump into the near menu level. So if we look at near menus, basically what they are, they're little panels that can either uh, float around in 3D space or stay world locked to a certain location. And that's exactly what we're going to need for the PC. We just want a tiny little window that uh, can contain a few buttons. So the first thing I'm going to do is select one of these pre-built uh, blueprints and just duplicate it. So since I know I'm going to want uh, two buttons along with maybe three to four other buttons on the side, I'm going to select the blueprint near menu 4x2. So if we browse to that, let's just duplicate it real quick, duplicate it, and let's call this a BP main menu. 
All right, now that we have a main menu blueprint, let's create a level to place it in. Whenever working in mixed reality, I always select empty level because in mixed reality, we're working with the real world, so we don't need a skybox or any other objects to represent our environment. So, if a new level selected, first thing you always want to do is drop a player start in. The player start in this situation will act as the origin of the virtual world and real world. So, let's just set it to the origin, just to be clean. And then, we will navigate to the main menu blueprint we just created and drop it in. So if I place that at the origin and hit play, I won't see anything because I'm inside of it. So what we'll want to do is let's place this a comfortable distance away from the user. About 40 centimeters is a comfortable uh, distance for people to reach out at. So let's place it a little bit further than that, let's say 60 centimeters away. And if I hit play now, you can see I'm facing the menu from behind. And that's just because um, a lot of Unreal components pay face along the positive x-axis. So to fix that, we'll just rotate 180 degrees around the z-axis. And now if we hit play, our near menu is right in front of us, and we can even hit a few of the buttons with our simulated hands. Next thing I want to do is create the actual Blueprint computer. Um, and since Daryl and I are working in conjunction on this, uh, I don't want to step on his toes if he's making any other changes. So I'm going to create a brand new Blueprint and just child from the Blueprint that he's already created. So I'm going to name mine uh, BP underscore computer. And I'm just going to drag that into the scene. Um, we'll put this 60 units away, and then we'll just kind of move it off to the left a little bit. Maybe we'll rotate it a little bit, just to kind of frame it nicely. So if we open up the blueprint, you'll see there's quite a few things going on in here. Um, first thing is, I'm going to set my near clip plane to be a little closer just so we're not clipping into ourselves and this menu contains a few components such as a back plate which is this blue background that their buttons sit on um, some grab dots just indicate to the user this is a grabbable surface and then we have this button so this is a toggle button um, and it allows us to pin and unpin the near menu and what we mean by pin and unpinion is that basically toggles this follow component. What the follow component does is when it's not active, your hologram just sits in space and hangs out wherever it currently exists. But when the follow component is activated, the menu will move towards you and kind of hang out above your waist and always tag along with you. And that's great for situations where you need to uh, maybe walk across a room and you don't want to have to carry your UI with you. It'll just follow you along. Um, another great thing about near menus is if you did want to carry them across the room, they have a what's called a generic manipulator component on them. And this component is actually what allows you to grab the menu, pick it up, move it around. Um, and you can apply this to any object in Unreal and uh, you'll be able to pick it up and move it around. So I've been talking a lot about buttons. Let's actually start configuring some buttons for our panel. Uh, so this panel will only need two buttons. So let's get rid of these other buttons. Um, I'm just going to set these child actors to none to get rid of them. And then I'll delete these last two. So that gives us button five and six. Let's move button five right above, or sorry, let's move button six right above button five. And to do that, we'll move this over to 4.8, and then instead of negative 1.6, let's make it positive 1.6. Remember, these buttons are 32 by 32 millimeters, so that's where the 1.6 comes from. It's half of 
32 millimeters. Uh, so now, let's give these a name that means something. Let's name this one Explore, and let's name this one Config. All right. And then, if we go into the Child Actor template, we can actually label the button here. So this one is Config, and this one is Explore. Now right now these have icons that just came from the example, but they don't really represent config or explore, in my opinion. So let's go and look at the label brush. So sorry, the icon brush. If we open up the icon brush editor, every icon on a button is just a glyph in a font. So you can pick any character you want. I think for config, let's do uh, a bunch of sliders. That makes sense. And then for explore, maybe I think this compass makes sense for exploring. Perfect. And one last thing I'm going to do is right now, this child class is just using the normal pressable actor. I want these buttons to have state. I want be able to, I want people to be able to tell if they're on or off. And fortunately, we have a few button types that can do that. So right now, it's, we're using the normal pressable button actor, but we have a check button, radio button, switch button, and toggle button. What I want to do is use the toggle button. So I'm going to switch both of these to be toggle buttons. Let's compile, save, and let's hit play. And you can see how toggle buttons are different than normal buttons. So now when I press these buttons, they get this kind of light blue backplate on them. And that's exactly what I want to do to relay to the user that this button is toggled on. But one problem is the both buttons can be toggled on at the same time or toggled off. And I always want to have one button on and the other button off. To do that, we're going to add a new component which is called a UXT toggle group. And UXT toggle groups, uh, they take an array of buttons. So let's take our first button, config, and our second one called explore. And we can give it an initial selected index. We'll say index 0 is the initial selected one. So now, if I hit play, we can see config is toggled on initially without me having to touch anything. And if I tap explore, uh, config toggles off and explore goes on, and vice versa. So that's what I'm looking for. Now that we have two buttons to drive the tabs of our menu, let's go about actually creating the tabs. To do this, let's look back at the main menu and we could just throw all the UI components into this blueprint, um, but that this blueprint might kind of explode in size pretty quickly and get out of hand. So what we're going to do is create another child blueprint that's going to act as the first tab, and then another child blueprint which is going to act as the second tab. So first thing, let's create a new blueprint. We'll just inherit from actor. We'll call this bp underscore config. And the first component I'm going to add to this is the UXT UI element. And let's just make this the root. So UI elements, they are kind of a utility class that help us uh, group UI into, I guess you could say, almost folders. Um, and they have a nice uh, library of functions, such as hiding UI uh, from being visible and interactable to either or, so being visible and not interactable, or interactable and not visible. So we're going to use this functionality later, but for now, just think of this as a, a container around a bunch of UI. So next, let's add a child actor. And let's call this, we're going to have 
four different uh, config buttons for our PC. We're going to have light, um, another child actor. Oops. Let's add another child actor. We're going to call this one dark. And then another one for uh, air cooled. Let's call it air. And then another one for liquid cooled, which we will call liquid. Okay. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to make the light and dark buttons toggle buttons. Let's also add our air and liquid buttons. Uh, for these buttons, let's do something a little different. Let's make some radio buttons. These light and dark buttons, let's give them an icon that actually shows the color of the object. So I'm thinking for this, we'll just make a little dot, which kind of shows a color palette. Same dot here. And let's actually increase the size a little bit on these. So let's try about two. Scale them up. And then for the dark, let's make the color a little bit darker. So let's try uh, maybe a little darker than that. Like that. OK. And then last but not least, Give them a good label, light, dark, and air, and liquid. And since we don't want to be light and dark at the same time, or air and liquid at the same time, we're going to add some toggle groups. So. This is the toggle group for color. And then a second toggle group for, we'll call this config. So color, it's going to have two items, light, dark. We're going to start with light as the initial setting, and then same for this, air, liquid, and air is the initial selected object. OK. So now let's set up our child actor for our tab. Oops, I put that in the wrong spot. Delete. We want this under the scene root, child actor. OK. PP config. So now these buttons all live on here as their own little child actor. Now, what I want to do is show this tab when config is selected and hide it when explorer is selected. So. To do that, let's jump into our event graph. And remember, we made a toggle group for the explore and config buttons. There's an event called on group selection changed, which we're going to use. And this event gets fired whenever explore or config are pressed. So, now when the group selection changes, we're going to key off the selected index. When it's 0, we're going to show the config tab. And when it's 1, we're going to hide it. So let's compile and save. And let's run this. So already, we've got light selected and air selected. Now if I tap Explore, it hides, shows, hides, shows. Awesome. So that's working. So now that we have our main menu layout set up, 
Let's actually make it drive something on the PC. Let's try to change the color based on these two buttons. So first thing, let's open up the computer blueprint. Let's make a new function called toggle too many G's, toggle color. And it's going to take a color index as a parameter. And for now, let's just print hello to make sure we're here. Well, let's, let's print the index. How about that? All right. Now, this function needs to be called from the main menu. There's a few ways we could do that. Um, you could use event dispatchers or blueprint interfaces. But to keep stuff simple, let's just do direct actor to the actor communication. We had these four buttons, light, dark, air, liquid. Light and dark are part of the color toggle group. So let's create an event on selection changed. And we're going to grab that PC. We're going to call toggle color. It's always a good idea to make sure it's valid. So let's do that. So if the PC is valid, we're going to toggle the color. And the index is actually going to come from the selected index. So we're going to pass in 0 when it's light and 1 when it's dark. All right. So now that all the variants are hooked up, we should be able to touch the dark button, light button, and I've even gone to the effort to hook up the air and liquid already. So now when you select liquid, liquid cooling turns on, air, air cooling tools turns on. So here you can kind of experiment with all the various configurations. Next, let's look at the Explore tab. So here we have three buttons, two check buttons and one normal toggle button. Uh, the check buttons are used simply for turning features on and off. So we can show and hide the glass on the front of the PC, or we can animate the fans on and off. And last but not least, the placement mode. If I turn that on, it doesn't look like much changes, but I'm now able to grab the PC and move it around. And this will actually use the spatial mesh on HoloLens to help you place the object in the real world. Um, let me explain a little bit more about what all these buttons do and what that means. So if we open up the Explorer tab, there's a little bit more going on here than the other, but uh, don't worry, we'll kind of go through this step by step. So toggle glass and toggle fans do pretty much the same thing. They grab the show glass child actor, which in this case is a check button actor, cast it to a uh, UXT toggle state component. Or sorry, it doesn't cast it, but grabs the UXT toggle state component and then simply binds to the toggled event. And that toggled event just calls this custom event, which grabs the PC and calls a function called toggle glass. And that function simply just turns on and off a static mesh. Toggle fans is the same thing. Cast a child actor to a toggle state component and then bind to the toggled event. And this calls toggle fans, which turns on and off uh, a few animations. The real meat of this script is the toggle placement button. So what this does is, same thing, grab the toggle state component, bind to an event. And I should mention this is all happening on begin play, so we do this once. Um, and what we do is call toggle placement. And all that's doing, if we jump into there, is turning on and off the UXT tap to place component. So this tap to place component is pretty handy. It allows you to simply tap on a hologram, and that hologram then uh, floats a fixed distance away from you and will interact with the spatial mesh. The one thing is, though, we need to turn on the spatial mesh. So to do that, we call start AR session or pause AR session with a specific AR session config. And then we loop through all the spatial meshes 
and turn them on or off. And this definitely needs a little bit more explanation. So let's look at this AR session config. So if we look at the session config, there's a few options in here. Uh, first one is generate mesh data from track, track geometry. So what this does is it tells HoloLens to use its various sensors to scan the world around you and generate meshes for the real world. So it'll generate messages for tables and walls and floors and ceilings. This next checkbox simply says, don't only generate meshes for uh, things to render, but also generate collision meshes for us to collide with. And then I'm just saying, let's uh, render the mesh as wireframe. And my quote-unquote wireframe material is simply just an unlit material that returns a nice blue color. So when I say start AR session in the config tab, I'm using this config file to say, hey, start scanning the room, or pause, stop scanning the room. Uh, these are all using Windows MR. OpenXR is coming out in Unreal 4.27, and Toggle AR Capture will be the preferred method to do this. So once I've turned scanning on and off, the next thing to do is to toggle the spatial mesh meshes on or off. And I have this kind of array of spatial meshes, and you're probably wondering, where is that coming from? That's coming from this component called AR Trackable Notify. This is a built-in component. And when you add this, it has three uh, events which are useful. So there's events for adding new track geometry, updating, and removing. So I've subscribed to all three of these. Uh, when we add new track geometry, I simply push the track geometry onto this spatial mesh array. When we remove one, I remove it from the array. And then when we update any geometry, I grab the uh, PC, or the Place PC button, to check its current toggle state to see if it's checked. And then I call this toggle spatial mesh function, which I wrote. And if you jump into here, what it's doing is uh, grabbing the current geometry, querying its classification, because not only do uh, meshes that are surfaces in the world come through, but also the mesh that represents your hand comes through. And if spatial mesh is enabled, I set its visibility true, I'll set it to false. And then if it's a hand mesh, we always want to disable collision on the hand mesh just because we don't want the hand mesh to be uh, colliding with any of our interaction raycasts. So no matter what, if it's enabled or disabled, we disable collision on the hand mesh based on its object classification. So unfortunately, this button doesn't really show much in the editor. But um, once we launch to HoloLens, I'll show you what this button does, and you'll be able to see the spatial mesh pop up and how we're able to interact with it. Now that we hooked up our UI and we have the PC built, it's time to test on device. Now, this takes a little bit of time to package, but there's a few other options, such as holographic app remoting, which streams your editor view to HoloLens, and the HoloLens will send back sensor inputs. Um, but this doesn't always give you an accurate depiction of how your application runs on device. So it's best to go to File, Package Project, and Package for HoloLens. I normally just save it to my desktop, and now Unreal will start generating an Apex for HoloLens. And once you have that Apex, you can simply sideload it. So now we have everything running on HoloLens too. I can select the Explore tab, hide the glass, and move our panel over so we can click on a few config options, change the PC to black, get a closer look at all the details, jump back, switch to liquid cooling, and then get another peek at what the liquid cooling config looks like, and jump back to our lighter color scheme. Then I want to place the PC on the table, so I'm going to go into placement mode, which shows the spatial mesh. At this point I can grab the PC and just aim it towards the table, 
and then tap to place it.